So uh, the Psychem Academy is part of a nonprofit organization, Thymingo, and I'll quickly introduce it to those of you who are, who are new. Um, we try and inspire uh, researchers to do science communication, to engage in communication to the broad audience with lunch talks like this one um, for free. And you can rewatch some of them on YouTube if you're interested in previous one. Some of them are in Dutch, but about half of them uh, are in English. And then we also have workshops um, in Brussels. So for those of you who joined from abroad, you can't join, unfortunately, but the others are very welcome to uh, check out our program on our website. Or if you're interested, we're launching uh, next season with podcasting courses, uh, popular science writing, um, infographics, etc. cetera, uh, very soon. So uh, I'll share the newsletter link in uh, the chat. And a practical announcement considering the chat as well. There's a Q&A um, um, pop-up in uh, this webinar. So if you have any questions during the talk, please do share them. I'll keep an eye on them and uh, either I will ask them for you, or if you're willing to, um, you can um, ask them yourself to Bike and Jana, which is a bit more pleasant, so please do. And we'll do that after uh, every presentation. Now, today um, is the first time we're having a duo lecture. And in this case, for gamification, uh, I think the combination of both uh, Jana and Bike will be very interesting. And um, it's also thanks to Jana that we can co-brand and co-organize today's lecture with the Berlin School of Public Engagement and Open Science. Now, Jana will tell you all about that in a second. Um, but first, we have two speakers, and I'll introduce them, introduce them both. Uh, first, Bike, uh, she is in Leuven, in her own country, um, and she's Associate Professor in Human-Computer Interaction um, Research, if I say that correctly, Bike. Um, but she's also the Director of the Interdisciplinary Kai Leuven Digital Societies, Society Institute. Um, she has a PhD in social sciences, but before that, if I'm not mistaken, she got a post-academic degree in web development. So you can already hear that she's got this combination that is perfect to uh, do research into gamification and think about uh, research and games um, and to co-create. Now, um, she will tell you about the importance of citizen science co-creation and participation in science communication as well, if I'm not mistaken, and the what, why, who, and how of uh, science communication. Jana, um, she also has a PhD, which is called if I, um, Alternative Urban Experiment um, at the University of Manchester. Um, so she's been a researcher herself, but she also developed games uh, freelance as Playview. And she um, now she's now based in Berlin um, with the Berlin School of Public Engagement and Open Science, obviously. Now, um, Jana, I'm going to let you take over and uh, explain some more about that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just to briefly introduce the Berlin School and um, where now work. Um, so we are a joint project between the Museum of Natural History here in Berlin, which is where we are based, um, and also Robert Bosch Foundation and Humboldt University. And our remit, our aim is basically to develop and support the, the field of public engagement with research, um, both nationally in Germany and internationally through collaborations. So we do that through three pillars in our work. Um, the first is around training. So we also have a training portfolio and we support researchers and practitioners in building up public engagement projects and developing their skills. Um, secondly, we are really involved um, in institutionalization and culture change processes, so we work with funders, with policymakers, and with different academic institutions to really embed public engagement in the research culture. And finally, um, we see ourselves as a kind of bridge between research and practice as well, so looking at the, the kind of the field of science communication and public engagement research, and what that can tell us about our practice and how we can develop that. And yeah, we're really pleased to, to co-host this webinar today. Um, we're really keen on international collaborations and that exchange that comes from it. So yeah, thanks to Simingo for having us. Um, and we will also be offering some trainings next year that might be publicly accessible. So um, when it comes to that, I will ask Helen to share um, and communicate that um, with you all. 
So thanks very much. I'll pass back over to you. Well, I think um, we can already start. Um, um, and for the audience, I, I again ask you to put your questions in the Q&A so that after the first talk, um, we can already go into discussion. And at the end, um, we will make some more time for Q&A. So if you have ideas, perhaps, or you want um, uh, the expert opinion of uh, our speakers, this uh, is your moment, um, because we have like um, 15 minutes at the end uh, to discuss ideas or questions. So please do, um, and then I'll uh, leave it to you. Okay, thank you, Helene and Jana, for the introduction. Hello, all. I do have a question for you uh, when starting my presentation. My question is, what are your top of mind thoughts when you hear the word science? Um, I'll let you think for a moment about it. And I'm very aware that by giving you time to also stare at this image, you might be somewhat biased maybe by the image you see here. And that's actually what I secretly had in mind. I'm hoping that the picture would already evoke the association that doing science is rarely an individual process. That it is about different kinds of collaboration to map out and put together the different pieces of the phenomenon that we're investigating. And this puts the word participation on the ra radar of associations linked with doing science. And this brings me to um, the heart of my presentation today, which will revolve around participation in science and more particularly participatory science communication. And I will also talk about gamification. The link will become clear uh, in a minute. Let me uh, first um, step back and reflect on uh, participatory knowledge uh, before I delve into the details of my presentation. Um, and talking about participatory knowledge, I would like to map out the spectrum ranging from mode one to mode two knowledge production. Um, my talk will mainly be situated uh, within approaches that have characteristics of what we would call mode two knowledge production, which is more transdisciplinary in, uh, in nature. What does, it, what does this mean, transdisciplinarity? Well, it implies that researchers from different disciplines within academia work together, uh, but that uh, these academic scholars also collaborate with people outside academia. And this, of course, change, changes the role of the researcher. Um, there is, in terms of research, less control for the researcher um, and more responsibility for the public. We are doing research on, with, and for. And um, this really brings co-creation of knowledge production and more participatory science approach, approaches on the radar. And we see that this notion of participation in society has gone mainstream. It's not only in academia, but also, for instance, in industry and the public sector. Talking a bit more about participation in academia, um, it can have implications already from the moment we're doing um, our, yeah, when we're deciding upon our research questions and we're um, gathering data for our projects. And one manifestation of it is the citizen science uh, trend. Uh, it fits within societal transformations in which citizens become key actors uh, and are more uh, actively involved in research. Um, so citizen science is the yeah, more explicit and clear involvement of citizens in scientific research. Um, it fits within trends such as the democratization of science, the mode two science that I talked about, more transdisciplinary research. But I'm very aware that it's also an umbrella term and that within this term of citizen science, different manifestations can exist. And um, the variety and diversity of citizen science projects um, can differ in terms of whether people are uh, involved in active versus a rather passive way, whether it's a short versus a long-term participation, whether it's a small or large scale study. We can also ask ourselves more reflective questions. Um, very often citizen science projects 
uh, are linked with goals to have um, includes a variety of people, but how inclusive is it? So we can ask a lot of questions also in terms of research data. It's often is uh, often it's linked with open data, but is that the case? What's the quality of the data? It would bring me too far today, but the key message is that even under the umbrella of citizen science, we have to acknowledge there are different um, manifestations. A clear example of citizen science, one, one that is often cited in, uh, in literature also, is um, the Galaxy Zoo project. You see a screenshot here from the website, so it's an interactive project. And it invites people, um, everyday people, you, me, uh, citizens, um, to participate in uh, galaxy research. And so you can classify um, and help the classification of millions of galaxies by really micro tasks that together actually um, generate a lot of knowledge that is useful for scientific research. Um, yeah, participatory research does not end at the moment of collecting data. Also, when we talk about our research, when we communicate the findings, we can do so in a participatory way. And again, just like I did for the other building blocks of my talk, uh, I would like to step back first and reflect on the fundamentals before I move on. So talking about science communication, um, for me, it's important to also reflect on what I mean by that. Uh, for me, I use the word science communication as an umbrella term. We see also in literature that there is no clear um, definition, uh, but we see that it can link to se several aspects which uh, are not exactly the same. So when talking about science communication, we can talk about the communication that happens during research projects, so even before you have findings, you can promote your research actions, you can create public awareness uh, about a topic, so there's some kind of agenda setting. And then from the moment that you have some research findings, typically it's at the, more towards the end of your research project, you can uh, think of ways of uh, transferring that knowledge to the public, so the public disclosure of the findings, or even one step further, um, you can uh, aim for practice change through dissemination where you share your results and make them available for others to really use them. So all of this in my talk, when I refer to science communication, it can link to uh, one or more of these aspects. Um, again, um, reflecting on the way that um, science communication is being defined in literature, we see that very often the definition is linked to a particular goal. So what people hope to achieve when engaging in science communication. And we see that there are roughly three goals that typically um, are very often mentioned. One is to achieve scientific literacy in the public. So we hope that we um, uh, improve uh, people's knowledge about science. This implies knowledge about scientific facts and or how science works. A second goal that is often cited is to achieve a public understanding of science. That is, by uh, engaging people in science through deliberation, dialogue, for instance, uh, or the citizen science projects, we hope um, to give, um, to involve people more closely and also um, give them the opportunity to talk back, so to say, uh, so that scientists also listen to the public and that a mutual understanding is achieved. The last one, um, the last goal is, often cited from a rights-based perspective, uh, that is that um, there is um, almost a moral reason to involve societal stakeholders in research because they have the right to be involved in all matters that affect them, including um, uh, aspects related to, uh, to science. We see that together with these goals, um, a different approach might be taken Mapping out the approaches, again, we can put them on a spectrum from ranging from more linear approaches, typical top-down approaches where scientists share their findings to the public towards more multi-directional uh, uh, engagement where there's really um, yeah, 
a multi-directional communication where we go back and forth between experts and the public and even between publics and publics, let's say. For my talk, I will rely on the definition put forward by Burns and colleagues. Um, I will not read the definition in detail, but as you see on the slide, I highlighted a few words because these are building blocks of the definition that I like a lot. Um, as you see, the word dialogue and public is highlighted, so it's more situated towards the spectrum where we uh, think of two directional communication, not top down only, but also allowing the publics to talk back. Um, what you also see is that in terms of envisioned goal, uh, goals, it's more than only aiming to achieve like cognitive outcomes in the public, that is, in gaining people um, achieving. Uh, more knowledge, but also that science communication can boil down to building awareness, even creating enjoyment for science. So it's not only those cognitive goals that matter. And that's something I like about it. So it's broadening, broadening up um, the range of possibilities. And then the words media and activities. And this will form for me a bridge to also talk about uh, something particular, a particular media activity that is a gamification that I will talk uh, in the remaining of my slides. Um, definitely when considering media and activities in science communication, uh, I would argue to also consider creative media and or creative activities uh, next to the more standard publication formats. When we talk about more standard, it's like what we typically do when we communicate to peers. That's writing uh, publications, uh, giving scientific talks. Um, but in term, when we talk about creative uh, dissemination forms, we can also consider interactions such as games, websites, videos, visual art forms, video productions, performing arts, literary works, um, more design projects or prototypes. So I think that's all uh, within the realm of possibilities. Again, for today's talk, uh, I'm focusing because time is short and I will pick out one uh, media activity uh, that is gamification. I will put it in the knowledge translator machine and talk to you more uh, about what it is, why it can be considered, um, who to uh, reach out to and how you can do it. Um, again, uh, just like I did for the other building blocks, I take one step back and talk about what it is first. When we talk about gamification, um, well, uh, gamification is nothing more or nothing less than the use of game design elements, but in a non-game context. Again, um, looking at the existing literature on gamification, we see that when it really comes to the operationalization of what exactly constitutes a gamified system, that it's unclear, it's rather a challenging endeavor. Very often it's equaled with the use of certain game design elements such as badges, leaderboards, challenges, social elements. However, we acknowledge that the definition does not specify like how many of these elements you need, what system stops to be a gamified one and when it's to be conceptualized as a fully fledged video game instead. Um, also what I would like to uh, tell as a side note is that um, there does not exist a deterministically one-to-one -one relationship between a game element and how it will work. So this means that the same game ele ele element, like for instance the badges, can be interpreted by someone in a, certain in a certain context as, let's say, for instance, a positive feedback mechanism, whereas in another context, it can be interpreted as a finish line or even in, for other people or in another context as a collectible. Uh, so these are some side notes um, to take into account when thinking about gamification. Again, giving you an example and also staying within that sphere of citizen science of which I've been talking in the beginning, uh, about which I've been talking in the beginning of my presentation. Um, Ops Identify is an app uh, which can be um, labeled as an initiative within a citizen science project. It deals with 
uh, allowing I and mean, inviting people um, to take pictures of wild animals, plants in the greater European region. And people can take pictures by their mobile phone and then uh, the system tells you uh, more, gives you more information about the observation. So you as uh, the user, you learn about nature, but actually by doing so, you also contribute because it's being used um, all these observations are being used to map out and monitor the diversity of our species. So all the small clicks and pictures together, they help us to um, get a good overview of um, what's the status of the diversity of our um, nature. Um, in a recent um, update of this uh, app, they included also badges. So you get a badges within categories, uh, links, and based on your uh, observations that you make, but also uh, there are challenges, especially for you, so to make sure you're more engaged in the system. So that's why they experimented with gamification features. So why can you consider gamification? In order to give an answer to the why question, I will shed a light on both the researcher's perspective and the public's perspective, so the people who are um, uh, playing with the gamification elements, so to say. From a researcher's perspective, we see that um, the reasons that have been mapped out in literature can link to two clusters of motivations. Um, there are researchers who uh, consider more creative approaches of doing science, for instance, um, via gamification for moral reasons because they hope that by uh, adding these gamification elements, they can engage a more diverse public and also a higher number of um, people. So it's within the citizen science as the democratization of science uh, ID. Um, also linked to more moral reasons is that this democratization of science entails more than just the distribution of work, that it also involves distributing rewards, recognition and responsibilities. Next to these moral reasons, we also see that there are pragmatic reasons that um, yeah, make that people uh, consider um, things like, for instance, gamification in citizen science projects, for instance, and that's linked to um, the aim and the hope to have more and also better data. And uh, also the goal to uh, allow the public to uh, engage in a different way with scientific knowledge and make them uh, motivated and engaged over a prolonged time period. When shedding a light on the public's perspective, uh, previous research has shown that the motivations for people to engage in a gamified citizens science project boil down to three motivations ordered in a level of importance. On the top is really people, people's intrinsic motiva motivation to contribute to what they consider a scientific goal. And it's an uh, add-on and a plus that, is, that they can do so in an entertaining way. Next to that is the genuine interest in science and then um, yeah, engaging in these gamification for fun uh, is also a nice add-on. Who can we uh, engage and who can we reach out to? We might question uh, when we talk about the who question, can we only reach the digital savvy citizens, so those who have good digital literacy or even ludo literacy, so uh, previous background in uh, in and with games, to some extent, the answer is yes, because we've seen in previous research that um, when people lack some gaming or digital literacy skills, that they actually might accidentally ignore these game elements. And hence, if they can't see them, don't notice them, it cannot have an effect. And even if people notice it, people need to get to, to yeah, get some familiarity with it before these game elements can have an uh, impact, for instance, have an effect on uh, people's motivation. Uh, even with people who are um, digital literate or, uh, and or have this gaming literacy, we see that some people um, even intentionally ignore the gamification elements and then we can understand this as part of in impression management. So that's because uh, of several reasons, maybe um, people might think it's childish uh, or 
experienced gamers might think the gamification is too shallow, or um, they might want to come across as being really generally motivated in a scientific level goals only, not needing the gamification elements. So it's a way to showcase their intrinsic motivation for the scientific goal. Um, having this in mind, so knowing that we um, need to have some digital literacy skills or some familiarity, there is also another tip to make it work and how to implement it. And that is to acknowledge that people need to have a pre-existing motivation. Uh, that's a prerequisite. Uh, gamification alone will not do the trick. That means that if you have a citizen science project, uh, it's not because you have gamification that you will get people into it. So people need a prior interest in the project, need to have an um, interest in the topic of it, the scientific theme. So there is this kind of motivational threshold. Uh, gamification alone will not be the reason for starting uh, a gamified uh, session. However, we see that gamification can add stickiness. Uh, it can be the motivation to trigger the initiation of a new gamified session. So eventually it can um, be promising to establish more prolonged engagements. At the end of my talk, um, I would like to reflect a bit more, um, reflect on two elements. I'm very aware that I have been talking in terms of a buzzwords. There are two buzzwords that were dominant in my talk. One is participation and the other one is gamification. So I feel it's important to um, reflect for a minute on uh, also when it can potentially go wrong. Uh, or when we misuse these buzzwords. And one of it is um, the fact that uh, I told you participation has gone mainstream. It's, uh, it's um, getting more and more popular in academia, uh, industry, public sector, but we see that the ethical reflection on it is not that popular <laughs> and mainstream. Um, uh, looking at the letter of participation as put forward by Einstein, we see that what many people in public discourses label as participation, for instance, when we inform the public or we consult them, is actually from the scientific letter of participation part, uh, perspective only labeled as a symbolic participation. So it's only when we talk about partnership or even uh, giving more control to the citizens that it's being labeled as real participation. And also, as I told you in the beginning, when I was telling that there are different manifestations of, for instance, citizen science, that it's important to ask ourselves reflective questions. For instance, uh, are also other citizens than those from the upper and middle social classes involved in those projects? So how inclusive are we? And are we really establishing empowerment, uh, and positive impact on participants and society at large? So these are definitely reflective questions that we must ask ourselves um, and not just use the buzzwords uh, on the surface only. Also in terms of gamification, uh, there is a risk. Uh, for instance, when gamification is being used also in, uh, as a way of uh, science communication, there is a risk of using more creative and engaging ways of engaging in science dissemination. That is, yeah, it's the last step of doing science. So this means that the science that went before it should have a good quality because we cannot change it at the moment of dissemination. So we it should rely on decent science. And also we see that many of the strategies that are being used, um, for instance, in more creative, engaging ways of science disseminations, uh, dissemination are also strategies that are being used for propaganda, for manipulation. There, so there is also a risk in becoming engaging. So my message would be, it's okay if there is a decent science basic to engage and inform and collaborate with the public as long as it's not used for manipulation when we only focus on those formative elements. Um, also, when talking about gamification, we might wonder, do we need to gamify our entire world? Because there are also links, uh, risks linked to, for instance, social comparison, 
um, or the fact that we are yeah, using quantified metrics of engagement and it's not because it's it can be quantified that these are the most meaningful metrics. Um, we can also ask ourselves whether everything needs to be fun. What is there a moral obligation of fun? Whereas meaningful can tap into various other elements of eudaimonic experiences. Should, shouldn't we always be fun? And there is also the risk of the motivational overjustification. That means that when you use gamification, you might see it as a kind of external regulation. And actually, this might take away some of the intrinsic motivation. Right? Because we, here, we, when we talk about um, gamified systems, it's always using games, as so people can be uh, engaging with the games. Uh, but it's also linked to something which is having a non-gaming context. So we always have a motivation towards two elements. And it might be that um, yeah, the motivational, intrinsic motivation is overruled, undermined by these external gamification elements. So that's a real risk. And finally, the persuasive discourses, uh, the promo talk, the buzzwords, um, when people use gamification for the sake of its rhetorical power to launch something as new and branded as innovative. Well, here again, I would like to um, acknowledge that the idea of gamification is not new and it existed even before all digital. Anna will tell us more about it, that um, the idea and, and tapping into the motivational pull of games is not limited to uh, the digital realm. And having said that, I've made a bridge towards the next speaker. Um, as a closure, I would like to acknowledge uh, lots of the brilliant researchers uh, that I've been working with and still work with. Um, one of it is um, one of them is Priscilla Valeva, who works within the Parkus project, uh, in which she um, uh, pursues tools uh, for people to engage in reflective uh, participatory science dissemination as part of the Parkus project. But also this presentation uh, builds on knowledge um, um, linked to the PhD research of Rob van Roy on gamification research, the PhD by uh, Chloe Dirks on creative dissemination methods, and the Citizen Science project uh, Snap the Nature, uh, linked to the OPS identified that I showed earlier. I have to practice what I preach. I told you and brought you a science story. Um, I said that it's Im important that the public can talk back, so you might have questions, concerns, comments, and I'm more than happy to take these, uh, to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky. That was a very interesting first half of uh, today. Um, I, we already have a first question and I encourage others to um, okay. add theirs in the Q&A. Um, but I think we will actually get into that also in Jana's talk. Um, the question is, does gamification always need to be digital? Are there situations where non-digital games are more effective? So Biki, perhaps you already want to share um, your opinion and we'll get into it in the next talk as well. Okay, thank you, Peter, for your question. Uh, I see the timestamp, which was five minutes before the end of my presentation. And by the end, I told that indeed, it's not limited to the digital. It taps into the motivational power of playing games where, um, um, yeah, um, the, the role of, of games and play actually is, is, is there for a long time. So my question is, does gamification, or my answer is, does it need to be digital? No, I revealed that by the end of my talk. And again, I'm sure that Jana will tell more about it because it's within her expertise to also talk beyond the digital realm. Definitely. Um, I'm going to ask you a question as well. Um, you have, you, you mentioned, um, that gamification is, um, or gamification elements are sometimes um, a plus, but also sometimes people don't really like um, these elements. You you mentioned that it ca can be a kind of impression management that people intentionally or unintentionally ignore um, some elements. But I was just wondering um, when you say like 
things like that. And also people need um, to have a prior interest before they will engage mm -hmm. and enjoy these gamification elements. I'm just wondering, isn't gamification also sometimes a way to engage people who weren't interested in advance? Could you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the definition of gamification is that we use it in a non-gaming context. So either it's uh, for research in citizen science, or you use it like for, in, for instance, in education, think of Duolingo and these apps that also use uh, gamification. So it's, there is always, or very often a serious goal behind it. And people need to have an interest in that serious goal. If you're not interested in learning a new language, gamification won't do the trick. <laughs> but if you say like, oh yes, I'm considering to do, to learn a new language, maybe I will install an app, it's an app with gamification. Well, you have installed the app, you have this motivational, overcome this motivational threshold, you are uh, using it. And then maybe gamification will do the trick to uh, get you more often there or uh, um, create a deeper engagement, but you need to have that prior uh, interest first. Okay, so I guess one of the challenges is also to uh, to um, engage more people in, a, in an earlier step. Um, mm -hmm. And I think science communication can is really important and my my recommendation would be to not wait to engage in science communication until your results are there but I'll already establish a public um for your uh, yeah for the phenomenon that you're researching and already create awareness throughout the project uh, about what you're doing i think this way we can also yeah invite and reach out to the public to engage with it at a earlier stage and this can even shape our research okay well, thank you very much. There's another question by Linda, but Linda, I um, suggest we keep it until the end because I think it will be interesting to hear uh, both our experts uh, answer. And if you like, it would be uh, amazing if you would uh, ans uh, ask it um, live. Um, so we'll get back to that, Linda. Um, thank you. Jana, Jana, I suggest, oh, but the, no, we have some more questions. Um, Bruno uh, said, you spoke about criticism on gamification from the functional side. But there is also some more left-wing criticism on the political side, that gamification is a kind of laborization, laborization and dressage of play, which should be a free disruptive activity. Do you see some room for a kind of critical theory or approach of gamification? Yes, that's what I hinted upon when I said that um, it's not only a matter of the distribution of work but that we also have to think about what do they get out of it what's the distribution of the rewards um and it's definitely there is room for a critical theory and there there are also yeah, many critical things to say also about using and misusing the persuasive tactics and, and, and the time of people and the contributions they they make so we have to be reflective on what do people get out of it is, is it really empowerment or is it exploitation also, the people who are engaging with gamification, again, we're creating data on those people again, um, data that can be used and misused. We're quantifying live and everything can be quantified. So yes, indeed, Bruno, um, very relevant. And I would love to talk more about this um, at a later stage. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think um, it might be an interesting discussion to continue on at the end. Um, so thank you for the questions. And if you have some more about this specific talk as well, you can still ask them and we'll take some time at the end. But first, uh, I think many questions will also be answered in Jana's talk. Jana, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, okay, is that all showing clearly? Yeah, great. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Bika, um, for your talk. Um, it's been really fascinating to hear your perspective. And I think a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about now um, connect um, with your view and also just provide a slightly different approach to games um, and where I'm coming from. So I actually think um, it's quite useful to talk a little bit about my personal journey into games, because I don't come from a traditional um, game design background or game studies background at all. Um, as Helene mentioned in my intro, um, uh, I have a 
studies in ge human geography. I did my PhD on the subject and I specifically focused on urban creativity. So I was really interested in how people um, reclaim spaces and um, work with those spaces to put into practice a vision of how cities could be better. So for example, places like this, this is Christiania in Copenhagen, an autonomous area. I also worked with urban gardens and squats. So this idea of reclaiming public space, of doing something different with it. And during that time, I um, discovered what's called street games. Um, some people also call it pervasive games. So these are events that take place in public space, usually in cities, and they might look something a bit like this. Um, they could be treasure hunts, they could be chase games. Um, sometimes you have kind of weird interactive stories where you meet a character and then get sent out on a mission. Um, or like this example, um, you know, people in silly hats playing just in a courtyard. And what I found really fascinating about these events was the intermingling between the city and the story. So the kind of real urban environment, um, the things that you interact with, the people that might watch you and might go, what on earth is going on here? And at the same time, um, the players were in this play world and kind of navigating those zones, completely away from boards or screens or anything that you would usually associate with games. Alongside that, I found it interesting that a lot of these games actually tackled quite big issues. So they were, you know, looking at questions of surveillance, questions of AI. Um, this particular game here was about social class. So there's something going on there where such an unusual playful activity can bring an insight into these bigger topics. And fast forward a few years after I finished my PhD, I decided that research wasn't really for me. So I started working more on public engagement projects. And for me, it was a really logical step to bring games into that work of science communication and engagement with research. Um, maybe it's just worth saying at this point as well, um, also because Bika mentioned, you know, kind of the play element um, as opposed to games. So I use games and playful experiences quite interchangeably. Um, to me, it's not really about strict definitions um, here. So play and playfulness is an attitude towards the world. It's how you engage with what's around you in a kind of open and receptive way. And games for me facilitate that play. They're kind of a structured context that allow play to emerge. So just as a background, um, if I, you know, kind of switch my terminology a little bit here. So I also want to say a few words about why we might want to use games in science engagement. And actually, I agree with a lot of what Vika has presented already. Um, I personally now work in public engagement, so that's the umbrella term that I tend to use. Um, it's about engaging different publics with research. So the overall aim here is really to um, give publics, non-scientists, a voice in research as part of a democratization process, so making research more democratic. And that has a benefit in both ways. Um, so it shapes the questions that we might want to ask in research and um, the topics that are interesting. Um, it broadens the knowledges that can get included in a scientific discourse. So lived experiences, um, different ways of understanding the world. And it also gives um, the possibility to have different kinds of interpretations and ways of implementing research. So to me, science engagement um, is really a two-way process. Um, it's about that dialogue idea um, that Bika mentioned as well. And for that to happen, for this kind of broadening to happen, uh, this hinges on two core points. So we first need to make complex and abstract research accessible to different publics. It's no good if I hand someone a 30 page, you know, peer reviewed journal article and go, okay, there you go, please let me know your opinion on it. It's just not going to work. Um, we need to look at how the ideas can connect with people, um, how they can be made relatable. And then secondly, um, in order to bring people into the conversation, we need to facilitate these opportunities for dialogue. So we need to create the spaces, the capacities for that to happen in the first place. It's not, it's not going to happen automatically. 
And so the games that I'm going to talk about today, they're really looking at two, these two elements. They're not educational games. So um, it's not about teaching people something through games. And I actually think um, games are not necessarily the best tool for that. Um, for me, it is more about, yeah, kind of opening up these wider spaces. And I'm going to show that um, on three different concepts that I'll, I'll talk about now. So enchantment, ambiguity, and agency. And I'll talk you um, through those now. So let's jump in with the idea of enchantment. Um, this is a notion that I have taken from Jane Bennett, a political theorist. And she basically says that enchantment is the cornerstone of generating an ethical responsibility in the world. So very briefly, um, in order to really care what's about what's around us and kind of take an active interest, we need to feel a sense of joy and wonder and connection. And in her work, she relates that to the kind of alienation that many people experience from their places and their communities, but also, for example, um, the efforts of the environmental movement. And what is really interesting in her work is that she says enchantment isn't kind of the big, you know, the big wow moments. It's about the really small mundane aspects around us and really rediscovering objects and experiences that can fascinate us. She also says that enchantment can be actively created. So by engaging our senses and by kind of making space for this interactive fascination to happen, um, we can feel enchanted and we can build up connections with things. And I think that's a really interesting um, route for us to go into the world of science and research, which can sometimes feel quite abstract. Of course, there's some research, you know, that's really intrinsically exciting. Um, people talking about the birth of stars or talking about black holes. That's great. That's cool. But what we're finding when we work with researchers now, a lot of them are very specialized in a subject and they actually, they sometimes struggle to really see how can my topic be exciting to someone else? You know, I, I enjoy it, but how can I transport that enjoyment across? And so I would argue that games provide a potential entry point here. And I want to illustrate it with a couple of examples. Um, so the first um, point here is about tactility. Um, when we experience objects, we have a really different way of getting um, to an understanding. It engages our senses, um, our brains are included in a different way, and as this kind of embodied engagement with a subject. So the example or the image that we've got here is from a game called the data science game that I worked on a few years ago, and it's effectively about um, health data and data science using patient records and um, how that can lead to new treatments, to the analysis of treatments, but also some of the ethical questions around data sharing, anonymity, and so on. And so one of the core elements of this game installation, which was played at festivals, so it's kind of a store with different boards and different activities that all melded together um, in this final sort of sampling board. Um, it was about sample sizes. So having more data might give you better information on something. But we replicated this all through these colorful beads and through scoops that you could take and the players would complete different activities and then they get a scoop. So we didn't have to explain anything about sample size specifically. It was a really tactile, visceral experience and the players could then decide which treatment they want to go for. So this is a very simple moment, how you can include this idea of enchantment in a science communication activity, even if it's not maybe a full game. A second example um, comes from a game called Downpour. Um, this was a street game that looked at flood risk and flood risk management um, in Manchester. And I'll say a bit more about the game um, in a moment. But just uh, this image here shows part of a treasure hunt um, that was within the game. So players would go out and find different um, scientific ideas hidden in various places. In this case, in a um, briefcase locked with a code. So they had a puzzle to crack. And this really brings out the notion of discovery. So the enjoyment you have when you find things, when you solve a clue. And this isn't necessarily about the topic at all. It's just bringing this kind of embodied um, enjoyment and providing these moments of connection and these moments of kind of an unexpected experience, again, very much in a real life space. 
So to me, enchantment provides a kind of entry point um, into science communication, into deeper discussions. So the question then is, where do we go from here? And that takes me to my second concept, um, which is that of ambiguity. Um, so ambiguity here means um, things that can have more than one meaning at the same time, where maybe meanings are diffuse or overlapping. And it's quite a central term in play studies, um, particularly from um, Brian Sutton Smith's work on play. And he has this beautiful quote um, that I've got here where he talks about play occupying a threshold between reality and unreality, as if it were on a beach between the land and the sea. And I just think it's so evocative of what play can be, this bringing together of different worlds, the sitting in between, you're kind of washing back and forth where you are um, in, in the moment. And um, a central idea that I find very useful here is the idea of as ifness. So when I play or when I have a playful moment within a game structure, I might be playing as if I was, I don't know, a witch or a space cowboy, or as if the world was invaded by zombies, or as if Manchester was threatened by a big flood. So I can have these kind of as if worlds and scenarios, or I might be pretend fighting or pretend stealing. And what happens here is that this ambiguity, this as ifness, allows me to bridge the game world and the player world. Um, so the real world and unreality, as Sutton Smith calls it. Um, you can think about it, for example, when you have young animals kind of play fighting and they bite each other. It's, it's not a real bite, it's not the full force, but it still signifies a real bite. And the play very much says, I'm playing as if I was biting you, otherwise it doesn't really make sense. So there's a constant kind of back and forth here. Similarly, with the street games that I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, this kind of interplay between the cityscape and the game world. And I think we can make use of this for research and science engagement because it gives us the chance to create these safe spaces in which we can explore different roles and different scenarios, but constantly allowing for players to make that link back to their own life, to their own experience and to their own interests and views as well. Um, so again, I will just um, show a couple of examples here. Um, Again, on downpour, so the, the flood risk game, um, the players were cast as flood risk advisors in the game. So in groups of four, they were briefed about their role. They got their high vis vests and hard hats and walkie talkie. And then they played through a one hour experience. Part of it was a treasure hunt. They had to make resource decisions, um, play through a few other little scenarios, um, meet some characters. And in the end, there was a big showdown to see how well their decisions protected the city in a future scenario. And what was really interesting here is that afterwards, people gave us really surprising feedback on how much of the experience kind of affected them and how they made those links between the real world. So for example, in the initial briefing, um, they were taken to a control room and there was an actor there kind of coming up to them saying, thank God you're here, um, you are the experts, you need to help us save the city. And one player commented on that very first moment of being briefed. I got emotional for a second. The actor seemed desperate for our help and it seemed real. Now, I wouldn't argue in any way that this was a real scenario. And of course, everyone knew it wasn't. The control room was in a youth hostel. You know, it had a couple of TV screens, that was it. But what was real was the emotional reaction. And I think that's really interesting. That's where we have a connection point for people to go, okay, there's something that actually affects my life here. Maybe I can explore this further. And that can actually be cultivated within the game a little bit more in depth as well. So again, looking at the data science game, um, here we, we framed the whole experience around uh, music because we didn't want to work with any real illnesses. So the players were tasked to cure an earworm and find different um, treatments like synth pop therapy or operatic cleansing. So it was all quite humorous and quite satirical. But before they started their game, they were given a card with their medical record. So things like you suffer from outbreaks of head banging or you, you know, you're allergic to brass band music. 
And we asked them if they were willing to share that data for research purposes. And then that decision had an effect in the game. But again, in the debrief afterwards, when we had a chat with the players, um, that was a really important moment where people said, well, actually, you know, I decided to share it in the game, but I wouldn't in the real world because of concerns I might have. Or people started asking, well, what even is my medical record? Where can I access it? Where, you know, where are these decisions taken? So that in-game moment immediately created conversations outside of the game. And this is where I think ambiguity has real power for science communication and also for this deeper public engagement and this cultivation of dialogue, because we can play with this back and forth moment. And that really takes me to my third um, principle, and that's that of agency. So right in the beginning, I said, Ultimately, we want to give people a voice in a wider um, research discussion. That's why we do public engagement. And um, this participation requires a kind of a, a, a capacity for agency. And we want to cultivate this agency. And this is where the games, particularly the games that I'm talking about here, is particularly powerful. And I think the discussion around enchantment and ambiguity so far has shown that there are these possibilities. So a game can be part of a wider framework of creating the conditions that people then feel enabled to contribute to discussions, because it gives them a chance to reflect, to think about their own opinions, their own standpoints about topics. What's really important here, though, is I don't understand agency in the game as a free choice. Um, and you find that a lot in, in game studies as well. Um, you know, it's not about the player can do what they want. And um, often choice in games is an illusion. And if it's done well, you barely notice, you get really invested. But effectively, you're following a story. What I'm more interested in is not the outcome, it's more about the routes that you take towards that outcome and kind of the, you know, the thoughts, the, the ethical choices that you make along the way and how that reflects back onto yourself. Um, I think the that quote from Rancière that I've got here um, is very interesting. So he talks about an emancipated spectator coming out of more out of theater and interactive theater but he talks about bringing people um, to abandon the role of a passive viewer towards taking on the role of a scientist and to investigate. And I think that's where agency really sits for me. Um, thinking about the downpour example as well, we're not expecting people to come up with new solutions to flood risk management within a one hour game. That's just not going to happen. But what we do want is stimulating an interest, maybe people asking, okay, what can I do? Can I get involved in a I don't know, in a citizen jury, can I get involved in tree planting? Where can I become active? And that also then challenges us, us to think back what we want to achieve with our games. And just a quick illustration of that as well. Um, so this is a project called Missing, a very, very different field. It was um, about youth loneliness and experiences of isolation. And it actually emerged out of a very interesting participatory research project um, with educational researchers, young people, and a mental health charity. And what we created at the end was a, a kind of game-based, playful, um, interactive story where groups of young people investigated um, a missing persons case through objects and through video testimonials. So again, drawing on that notion of enchantment, working with objects, working with kind of atmospheric setups or simple spotlights to make the room feel different. But the core element of the experience actually was the after show discussion. So um, we then brought objects from the game into the discussion and asked the young people to comment on them. So things like, you know, what could, her dad have done differently or what meaning did this object have for the girl or you know how do you see those connections and that gave the young people a chance to think about their own perspective but kind of projecting it onto the game world if they wanted to so it created kind of a safe space but they were able to really have an input and a voice in the discussion and interestingly, this these show discussions then fed back into the research. So it was really a chance for a dialogue around a very you know emotional, very serious topic um, that would be very difficult to achieve otherwise. So here in this case, 
the enchantment and the ambiguity really led to a bigger sense of agency and it also informed um, the activity program of the charity in the long run. There's really a wider context here to the game. So I just want to finish um, with a couple of brief final reflections. Um, so hopefully I have shown that games have a great potential to create deep engagement with research. And my point here really is that in these cases, it's depth over numbers. We're not looking at a huge amount of people that get to experience this. We're looking at small audiences, but the engagement you get is very in depth. I've also bracketed physical games because this is very much what I talked about now. So some of these concepts will translate to other games, but we might have to kind of reinvestigate how they work. I also want to flag up that some people consider this a trivializing of serious topics. Um, so this is something we've encountered quite often, and actually even in the missing project, the, the final one that I showed here, the researchers initially were really hesitant about the idea of game elements with such a heavy topic. Um, we solved it in the end by effectively calling it an interactive experience. To me, it's the game elements that really made the experience work and that made it powerful. But sometimes you just kind of have to navigate these discourses, um, particularly around play, that can be quite tricky. And I also would say um, collaboration or co-creation and testing are absolutely essential for making these projects work. So they require a lot of resources. This is not something you can do, you know, at the end of a project in a couple of days. It's a, it's a deep form um, of sharing and of inviting perspectives in. Um, but hopefully I've given you an idea of, yeah, how powerful can big games can be in this context. Um, and yeah, that's where I will leave you. And thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jana. It was, um, uh, in my opinion, very inspiring to see these um, diverse examples and uh, the additional effects that these uh, games can lead to. Um, I already mentioned that there were some more questions um, and uh, I think Linda has a question. I'm going to um, offer her the opportunity to talk. Uh, Linda, is it uh, possible yeah. for you? Yes. Thank Hello. You. Uh, thank you both for your um, beautiful presentations. It was very clear and um, also very inspiring. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I do have a question. I'm very interested in stakeholder engagement in research. And I think this, this strategy of gamif gamification would be a very, um, well, a straightforward tool to, to get a lot of stakeholders on the board. But um, what stakeholders should I identify if I'm going to use this as a sort of strategy? And what are certain arguments from their perspectives that can um, motivate them to enable gamification in research? I'll start and then Jana, you can complete. Uh, thank you, Linda, for your uh, question. Um, it's a very good one because the question like who to reach out to is super, super important and we must pay attention in order not to forget people who in our society tend to be invisible. So I think it's a very careful and, and a difficult exercise sometimes. Um, but we can also look at, at, at it when we zoom out a bit. We have this, uh, what is often called the quadruple helix model, where academia is working together with people from government, industry, and then uh, community groups and organizations. I think this is a good mapping to look at, like in which uh, clusters to think of, but then even within a cluster, we have to think like, who do we give voice? Um, and I think this depends uh, from project to project. Um, and I think it's good to talk to, to people and also ask, are we asking the right people and, and to stay reflective throughout the project to see that you're not overlooking people. Uh, but there, at least not that I think of, <laughs> there does not exist a, a checklist like those are the ones that you definitely need to hear. Um, it depends like what is the theme of the project that you're working on. Um, um, and then uh, having this sensitivity to be inclusive, I think that's a recommendation that I would like to share today. I don't know, Jana, what you would 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd really just echo that. I think actually before you ask, you know, who are my stakeholders for gamification, I would actually ask who are your stakeholders first and then see if gamification is the right tool for it because it's not the right tool for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's that's a really important point. And beyond that, I mean, I think you you know you've seen a few different examples here. Games are very very different. They have very different characteristics how they work. So if you think okay, this could work for my stakeholders a group for my target audience then really think about okay what do they already engage with you know are they young people who work with their mobile phones a lot are they maybe policy makers who are used to scenario games um or you know are they people i can meet when they're out shopping and do like a little playful interaction with so i think define your stakeholders first and then you can see what the the right tool is and within gamification there's a lot of potential um, for different audiences Yes, thank you. My apologies, I was still muted. Uh, I have an anonymous question, so I'll ask it for this person. Thank you for your question. Um, How long do you recommend the gamified activity should be? One session over one week, over a month, over the course of a semester? What have you found is the ideal length of time to make gamification effective? Not an easy question, I think. (laughs) Jana, I don't know if you want to... uh, I'm happy to start, um, but yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that question, really. I mean, I think certainly in the projects that I've shared today, um, the long period was the creation. Um, Some of these events only, you know, took place a few times, or some of them took place with quite like long gaps in between for different audiences. So really, most of them were a one-off experience. So the actual, you know... um, game only took an hour or however long but the long period was the creation and particularly the collaboration so if you're thinking about um you know working with researchers with creatives maybe with game designers that takes time and what also takes time is the testing because this is really really important for game design that you once you have ideas you get them out in front of people because people will always do things completely differently from how you expect them to so um Yeah, I think there's potential to involve people in that creation process as well. So if you want to give people a deeper understanding of the topic and maybe more chances to communicate with research, um, I think that co-creation could be really interesting. Um, Yeah, I think that's probably all I can say on this. Otherwise, it really depends on your precise aim and your precise project. And maybe, Bika, you want to contribute. Yeah, um, what you say makes sense to me too. Um, in our project, we've mainly focused on gamification systems that already existed. Um, and then, yeah, the same question can also be asked, like how long can you engage people with it? We have looked at gamification uh, project where we engage with people throughout one semester. That was an application which was where it made sense to think about engagements uh, over the course of a semester because I, gamified one of my courses at one time so that yeah then that was a meaningful period but if you think about the ops identify app for instance that's an app which people use for years so and um, there the ambition is to engage and continue engaging them for a long period of time uh, but i know from the people that um, launched these gamification elements in the ops identify app that they were hoping to broadening their um Uh, user group with also more younger um, app users Um, and I think it's already a success for them if we can keep them at least uh, engaged for a couple of times Um, so it depends like what what are the metrics that you decide for yourself uh, what is meaningful in the context of your projects Um, Yeah, I think as long as the gamification is not doing any harm (laughs) and is keeping people motivated in a positive way and and steering their behaviors in in a similar direction, I would say it's a success and every new session is a a plus. So I guess experimenting and finding partners if uh, you want to try um, using gamification in a project for the first time might be a way to cope. I think we lost you for a second, Vika. Would you uh, mind? I yeah. wanted to say there are so many different implementations. Uh, you cannot compare one gamified system with another one. Um, people might give different meanings. Uh, also, from a creator point of view, to which extent are you 
uh, updating your materials. If it's all remaining the same, people have played it out in, in, in one month and you cannot expect them to redo everything again, or I think it's less likely. So are you, from a creative point of view, creating new challenges and, and feeding this system with new meaningful content that I think you can expect people to engage with it for a longer time. And so it all depends like how, which game elements do you implement? How give people, give do people give it meaning? Are you from a creative point of view updating it as well? Um, everything should be aligned uh, to, to consider it a success. Thank you so much. Um... Peter um, is waiting now uh, to ask his question. Peter, it's all yours. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes, I'm very much uh, interested into these talks because they strongly underline the importance of uh, the interaction, the dialogue between the people that organize the game and the one that play the, uh, plays the game. So we can both learn, I guess, and, and, and have fun. Um, but I also wonder you know, how far we can use the behavior of the players in a game uh, to, to learn about these players. Uh, is there some restriction there? Um, certainly, if you, do, if you don't really explain the game and what you do with it, with the result, there might be some privacy concerns, I guess. Um, I don't know. Um, if you if you uh, develop a digital digital game, there might be some quiz involved, or uh, or you might record the statistics on on the behavioral behavior of the players. Can these uh, statistics be used uh, straight away, or is there are there some restrictions there? The the same restrictions apply i'm not a legal expert but there is gdpr when we consider the european zone we have to inform people what will be done with their data give them also control we can only collect those data that we need for a system if it's also used for other purposes like for instance marketing purposes i think that you're hinting upon that i think this is causing really ethical question that people should be informed about that should not be the default option um yeah uh, the transparency about what is being done with the data rights kept uh, what are people people's rights from a consumer rights perspective as well are all yeah to be taken into account and, and to be respected i would say definitely yeah thank you i hope that actually the gamification is not misused for these elements to just gather more data mm -hmm. and that that would be the only reason and that's also something that i wanted to warn for if people start looking at these formal elements only there is also a risk that it's being used for um yeah manipulation or what are unethical uh, aspects and that that's really a risk and we should be careful that we're mm -hmm. not advocating this one so it should be a um yeah a, a correct application Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's the last thing we want, of course. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Then we do more harm than good. <laughs> I, I also have another question. How, how I find it quite difficult sometimes to persuade colleagues to to work to to uh, to work their game and and to persuade them that gaming can be some kind of a, a good a good tool for science communication. So um, how do you persuade them? <laughs> I'm happy to go first on this one. Um, I think there's generally, um, it's difficult to share games sometimes because so much comes to the play experience. So I think there's a general, you know, sometimes people that just hear about games don't necessarily get the depth or what really happens about it. So I think that's a general problem about how we communicate about games. But in terms of persuading people, I mean, hopefully, I think our talks today have given you some ideas as to, you know, how you can show the value of 
games and gamification and the real um, benefit that is given to both the participants but also back to the research and the researchers and I think that's a really good argument to make you know say if it means like we can have people more sustained or if it means we can have people better informed when they come to a discussion or whatever it is then I think that's a you know, we can make those arguments um, quite clearly. And I think a big part of that is also evaluation, you know, kind of tracking and reporting on what we do with our games work. So asking players for their feedback, maybe evaluating the impact um, and slowly building up a picture that these diverse creative methods are actually really rich. And just because they're a bit unusual or maybe don't at first glance seem to fit with into a model of science communication, they, they have real value for different audiences. Um, that's quite a general answer, but I think um, increasingly um, we have methods of showing the value and of, yeah, convincing people that we can use creative approaches. Well, Vicky, maybe you want to add a little bit to that. I don't know. I, I would like to add that what, what you um, share as an observation, Peter, um, sounds familiar. <laughs> um, so we, we we see it in literature. Um, I also, when I was uh, trying out gamification in my own class with uh, one of my courses, we did also um, yeah in that um, focus group sessions with our students, and then some of the students who were more hesitant, they just said like it doesn't fit with it with a serious university. <laughs> So, and here comes in what I said, that people might have different interpretations um, about what this means for them, and it's not necessarily the same. So a same game element or a game environment can be interpreted by different people. And the, the familiarity that they have with games can play uh, a role. So if they have a previous experience and that's a positive experience, it will make them more open. Um, so maybe Peter, for next team building activity, you can have a, <laughs> a playful team activity, and also together with the discourses, like Jana said, is the way you frame it. Um, we see also even from a recruiting point of view, if we're doing game related project and we want to also reach out to people who do not have game literacy, when we frame it like, do you want to participate in a game study or game related study? That that there is a self selection bias that only those who do have higher experience show up and, and volunteer. So when we then try to, to do a recruiting and we frame or see a little bit different, not that, that we're lying, but just the way we describe it, and we do not use the word game that explicitly, we do get mm -hmm. uh, more people. So it's also the way you frame it. And, and um, yeah, I think there are so many ways in which you can think of games or playful encounters and playful situations that um, that I'm pretty sure that everyone does have some experience with it uh, or can relate to it. It's also, yeah, that would also be my recommendation. Think about how you frame it. Great, thank you. If I if I may add something, Peter, um, of course I don't know what your um, whether you're a researcher or science communicator or um, or something else, but um, I do know we, at Symingo we work with a lot of researchers on different uh, levels in their career, so PhD students, um, mm -hmm. postdocs, um, and what we do notice is that people are often hesitant, um, and one of the reasons for that is exactly what you just described also for science communication in general or for to, to a broad audience, I mean. Mm -hmm. um, but often when people do um, engage in science communication, colleagues are perhaps positively surprised by the result. I remember when I was a researcher um, because I also uh, did a PhD um, and I uh, did a science slam. Um, let's say that some people weren't really um, eager, <laughs> but once you do it, people see that it can have a really positive effect um, on people's enthusiasm on your research and thus um, on the opportunities you get. So it's a lot broader what I just mentioned, but it, it does sound like the same issue a bit. And maybe um, if you go through with it, um, people, colleagues could be surprised in a positive way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I had some good experiences as well <laughs> with escape room, a floor game, and so on. 
Well, thank you for sharing that thank and you. for your question. Um, to end um, this session, um, there's a question, a very interesting question by Luciana. Luciana, I'm going to invite you to talk um, if you're able to. Um, please do ask your question yourself. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Vika and Jana, for this very interesting talk. Um, and my question regards um, cultural differences. So games, as any other cultural product, they often reflect specific views of the world that can be expressed in the game's mechanics, narrative, graphics, and uh, also in the way that people play or decide not to uh, play a game. So while the scientific projects are increasingly becoming more multinational, both from the perspective of the researchers' background, as well in terms of data gathering and research subjects, for instance, the origin of uh, include Global South or non-Western point of view in research production. So I was wondering if you ever faced a particular situation where these cultural differences um, challenge the, the combination of game elements with science communication, and if so, what is your advice to deal with this? And uh, thank you very much for answering my question. Yana, would you? Yeah, I, I'm happy. I can go first. Um, really, really interesting question, Luciana. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a lot we we still have to do also in terms of self-reflection, you know, around the types of science communication and public engagement offers that we do produce because they come out of a particular uh, Western culture, particular scientific mindset. Um, the one thing I immediately thought of was that I think co-creation has a real potential here. Um, so... A few years ago, um, I was involved with a project in Kenya and I was invited to bring games as one of the kind of communication tools. It was around air pollution and lung health um, and of engaging a community there. But I, I didn't create any games at all. What I did was run workshops with local um, artists and local community leaders to design their own games. And so, of course, you know, I'm still coming with a particular perspective. I might still be introducing particular narratives, but I would have never been able to create a game for that context. I just couldn't have done that. And that worked really well because they knew their audiences, they knew their cultural reference points. Um, they could say, oh, people will recognize this, you know. Um, so I think that's probably one of the ways in which we can bring in these more diverse perspectives and really then challenge our own practice as well about at which points can we design a systems for others or actually is it more about the co-creation of the process of the system itself where the interesting moment happens maybe the game doesn't matter so much in the end maybe it's about the process of defining the rules and the outcomes that brings the real value um yeah so that's my experience on that and i think i would like to work more in that form in future as well Piki, do you want to elaborate on that? Or yeah. Um, yeah. Um, very briefly, thanks for pointing that. Um, it's a very important discussion point. I do not have experience with games in, in several parts of the world. So uh, my um, experience in that regard is limited, but I also do believe in the power of co-creation and or diverse design teams. So I think the more diverse the team is of the people who do, create a game and or contribute to the creation of the game, I think the more we can also reflect diverse uh, worldviews. Okay, I think that's a beautiful statement to end with until you have a further, uh, unless you have a further question, Luciana? No, I don't. Thank you for your answers and uh, uh, kind regards from Brazil. Thanks. Thanks for joining. To end today's talk, first of all, um, um, thank you very much, Jana and Bike. It was very inspiring, I think. Um, if anybody um, is interested in an international collaboration, 
uh, regarding this topic or other topics, I think you should definitely check out the Berlin School of Public Engagement and Open Science. And you will receive a follow up uh, email on today's talk in which I will obviously um, add a link so you can get in touch. Um, I'll quickly uh, share our link to the newsletter in the chat in case you want to uh, be informed about future talks like this or our workshops if you're based in Belgium. And for those who speak Dutch, um, let me tell you already that in December we have a talk about um, opinion, writing opinions. Who uh, hit you expertise in an opinion stuck? It's a panel, um, panel conversation on that topic on December. 13. So you're very welcome. And if you have any questions uh, after today and you didn't get to ask them, do get in touch as well. And I'll uh, and I'll see whether uh, Bike uh, or Jana can still um, provide an answer. Oh, Anne Sophie wants to ask um, a question, and we have four minutes. So Anne Sophie, go ahead. Actually, it was a miss. Uh... Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. I wanted that. to go to the chat. <laughs> okay. Well, um, no problem at all. Uh, so thank all of you for being here. And um, thank you, Vike and Jana. Thanks a lot. Bye. Perhaps Bye. you next time. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much.